Nothing on the Bonnell Foundation's Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast should be considered medical advice. Medical advice can only come from your CF physician. Cystic fibrosis can be a devastating diagnosis, but living with the disease can bring positivity and a new appreciation for each day. From the Bonnell Foundation in Detroit, Michigan, it's the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast, sponsored by Vertex Pharmaceutical. Here's your host, Laura Bonnell. Did you know that your child should visit a pediatric dentist? Did you know that people with CF generally have better dental health than the rest of the general population? Are you familiar with a toothbrush that connects to your phone and will let you know if you're brushing your teeth correctly? Did you know if your CF child has reflux, which is very common in CF kids, this can impact their dental health? In this podcast, I talk with Holly Seabury with the Delta Dental Foundation. She has a wealth of information about dental care. No one likes to go to the dentist, but Holly gives us so much information that you will find yourself wanting to learn more. Did you know that if your child has CF or any chronic illness, they can have four teeth cleanings a year, even if the employer or the insurance says that it's not covered? Holly will explain how this works. Holly Seabury is the executive director of the Delta Dental Foundation. She is committed to oral health equity and advancing dental science through education and research. You are going to love this podcast. Thanks, Holly, for talking with us about the importance of dental care. I think it's something we sort of know about, we sort of think about. I don't think we all think about it enough, honestly. And awareness has been raised um, as I started getting requests for dental care with the Bonnell Foundation and found out that they could not get lung transplants until they had molars pulled and dental care done. So if you could kind of take us into the medical dental aspect of that, why is it so important that you have good dental care and get all of that done prior to a transplant? Well, it's actually really important that you just have good dental care, period. But prior to a transplant, and not just transplants, but a lot of uh, different types of chemotherapy and radiation, a lot of different medical treatments, you will have to have a clearance from a dentist. And that is simply because if there is untreated infection in the mouth, it could really wreak havoc post-op. So what they're really trying to do is make sure that there's no loose teeth that could cause a problem during surgery, because these are typically really extended surgeries, and they want to make sure that a loose tooth couldn't come out, possibly during surgery and compromise an airway. But what they're really looking for is any untreated infection that could really cause problems post-op, because We tend to think that things stay in our mouths, but we have a really robust blood supply in our mouths and actually a blood supply inside our teeth. And so when there's infection in our teeth or our gums, it's actually in our entire blood supply. And so it's traveling throughout our body. And the last thing we want after any type of major surgery is to have an infection, a systemic infection in our bloodstream. So they're just really trying to set patients up to have the most successful surgery possible. Absolutely. And I can just say from personal experience, I had a knee replacement. And then I think it was five months later, I had dental work done. My surgeon at the time did not, and this was just recently, didn't have me pre-medicate, got an infection and had to get my knee reopened because it was infected. And I'm just now feeling like I'm finally recovered from all of this. So it is critically important, um, first of all, to pre-medicate <laughs> with antibiotics if you're getting surgery. That's my recommendation, but I am not a doctor. But it's so important. And I think maybe we back up and start with just general dental care. What should we be doing every day to keep good dental care? Well, the good news is it's not that difficult. We should be brushing twice a day maybe more, depending on how frequently we eat and what types of foods we eat. Um, We should be seeing the dentist twice a year. And again, maybe more if we need more than two cleanings a year. And we should be flossing every day. And I would say of those items, what kind of gets lost a little bit is the flossing. 
yet that is critically important uh, because flossing prevents gum disease and gum disease is linked to all types of things like exasperating heart conditions, diabetes. It's linked to Alzheimer's disease. And the reason is, is gum disease is an inflammation. It's inflammatory. So when you have inflammation within your system, that's going to have an impact on your whole body. But obviously, when you have any type of disease in your mouth, any type of decay, infection, that has an impact on your entire body and the health of your entire body. But the good news is it's pretty easy to prevent. We're going to do really good oral care, uh, brush with a fluoride toothpaste. We're going to see the dentist and we can really keep this under control. And what advice do you have for people who maybe genetically don't have great teeth? Because that can play into it as well, even if you're doing everything you're supposed to be doing for daily care. Yeah, absolutely. And there are some people who who are born with weaker enamel. It's actually not that common. Genetics doesn't usually play a huge role in our oral health, but it can. And those are the people that really need to be working closely with their dentist. There's a lot of products out there that they may want to use as far as mouth rinses or different types of toothpaste. They may want to be doing regular fluoride treatments, even on adults. We tend to think of fluoride treatments for children. They're also very effective for adults. There's a vast amount of ways to keep dental decay under control if you're working very closely with your dental team. And, you know, you may be coming in more than twice a year. If you really do have something going on that they want to keep an eye on and make sure they're maybe doing more fluoride treatments or really just watching and making sure your teeth are are really clean and getting that really great hygiene visit, they may have you come in a little more often. Tell us a little bit about um, the Delta Dental Foundation, which obviously um, that's why we're here because we're talking about dental health and what you do. So the foundation really focuses on oral health equity, and we have a strong focus on on really kind of two things. One is getting people into direct care who struggle to get direct care. So that's typically the uninsured, the underinsured. We have large pockets of people who struggle with getting dental care. And sometimes groups that we don't think of, we do a lot of work with veterans It's a misconception that veterans have oral health care through the VA. Most of them do not, only 8% have oral health care through the VA. So different groups like that. Um, We've done a lot of work with refugees this past year. And then we also do a lot of oral health education and helping people understand how to take care of their mouth, how to take care of their children's mouths, especially individuals who may have chronic health conditions, um, who may have a permanent disability, making sure that they know how to take care of their mouth or the the mouth of the person that they're caring for um, and to keep their mouth as healthy as possible so that we're keeping their general health as good as possible. You know, the Bonnell Foundation, we've been fortunate to get a couple of mini grants and those go pretty much within two weeks after we get them. They go so quickly. It's not like we give them away over a year. There is such a need in the CF community because of lung transplants and dental care. And I also wonder, why is it that a lot of these complicated surgeries aren't covered by insurance? It seems like, you know, vision and dental doesn't get the same care as everything else from insurance companies. Yeah, it's interesting. And a lot of what people don't realize about dental insurance is if you're insured through your employer, uh, your employer chooses the benefits that you receive. So they're offered sort of a menu of benefits and they choose the benefits that they're going to offer to their employees. So we often, you know, I will hear from somebody like, went into the dentist. Why doesn't Delta Dental cover this? It's like, oh, your employer didn't choose that, you know, that benefit. So uh, always, you know, tell people to advocate for your employer to choose the benefits that their employees really need. And you bring up the point of uh, dental insurance and vision insurance being separate from, you know, primary care insurance. And yeah, it's always been that way. And it unfortunately creates a misconception among people that our mouths and our eyes aren't 
really part of our general health because they're not covered under general health insurance. And really nothing could be further from the truth. And we are always advocating for more benefits, especially within the Medicaid system, um, because most of the individuals covered under the Medicaid system do not have extra income to be able to afford things that aren't covered. But we've also expanded benefits under our commercial system. So under our commercial insurance, as just a standard benefit, we offer to anybody with a disability or chronic medical condition like CF, we offer four hygiene visits a year. We offer a behavior code that the dentist can bill if the visit takes longer. And we're really trying to reimburse dentists for the true cost of seeing patients, but also to make sure that, that if you have a child who needs to go into the dentist four times a year for their health, that we're covering that um, under these new benefits. So we're really excited to have been able to offer that. And that's not a rider, you know, that doesn't come at a cost to families. It's just a standard benefit. And we're actually the first insurance company, first large scale insurance company to offer those benefits to the individuals that we insure. So that is huge. And to make sure I understand it. So if they have a child with CF that needs more care, that is something they work out through Delta Dental? Through their dentist. Through their dentist, not through their insurance, not through their employer. Yeah, through their dentist. And dental insurance is nothing if not tricky. So although we offer this as a standard benefit, there were some employers who opted not to take that as a standard benefit. Um, if that is the case and you talk to your dentist and they say, no, your, your employer doesn't offer this, or if you contact your HR department, that is certainly an arena where parents can advocate and say, hey, this doesn't cost anything. Let's let's get this benefit on our policy so that I can take advantage of it for my child. But yes, we tried to make it as easy as possible for families and for dentists. So it's really working through the dentist office, letting them know that you have Delta Dental commercial insurance and then having them check to make sure those benefits are covered. And then they just build for that directly through their office. The parent doesn't have to get involved in that. What is the best advice as you're bringing children up and trying to get them to have good dental hygiene? It's definitely a roller coaster of getting your kids trained. And then once they're older, you know, checking in with them, hey, are you going to the dentist? And those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. So it starts early. And it really starts earlier than most parents realize. So we want to have that very first visit to the dentist be when the first tooth breaks through no later than 12 months. And for any child with a chronic medical condition like CF, getting started early on dental care is really important. And we do encourage, if possible, that families take their child to a pediatric dentist rather than a general dentist. And that is simply because pediatric dentists have received a lot of extra training in working with children with chronic medical conditions. And so they're a really great resource for families. And then to really work closely with that dental team as far as what is your child's personal risk, because we can't say across the board that children with CF are at higher risk of cavities. It really is individual. And it's, it's actually very interesting because studies have shown that many children with CF actually have less cavities than the general population. And there's a few reasons behind that. They think there may be some protectants in the saliva. They may be on antibiotics fairly often, which reduce then the bacterial load in their mouth. And they really should be, technically, they should be at higher risk of cavities because they're eating more and they're eating more frequently, which is kind of a recipe to start, you know, to cause cavities. But when you look at some of the studies, I really think a lot of it, some of it may be, yes, you know, related to the actual physiology. But when you look at what the parents say they're doing, a lot of these parents, in fact, in one study, 77 percent said they were brushing their children's teeth three times a day. Well, that's a really effective way to prevent cavities. So I think because CF parents are so aware of their child's, you know, medical frailty and making sure that nothing happens that could cause issues, 
that they tend to be very on top of toothbrushing and they tend to be very aware. And they were really good in this study about taking their children to the dentist. Um, They were really on it. So I think that is helping a lot. Now, here's what you see in children with CF. And I will tell you, you see this in the general population. Mm -hmm. They hit those teen years and here come the cavities. I've seen this with my own children. Uh, This is kind of across the board. And it is because of what you just said. It's because now they're brushing their own teeth. They're not having mom or dad stand over them and check in with them twice a day. And they start skipping those brushings. So those brushings start becoming 10 seconds instead of two minutes. And we see that uptick in cavities. So just to make parents aware that the teen years are a time where we do see that uptick in cavities. And what we want to remember is dental decay is caused by a bacteria, particular bacteria, Streptococcus mutans in our mouth. When we have an overgrowth of bacteria in our mouth, it's not only causing dental decay, but as we breathe, we're breathing that bacteria into our lungs. So any type of lung condition does not benefit from having an overgrowth of bacteria in our mouths. So it it is really critically important uh, that anybody with any type of lung condition uh, really, really stay on top of oral hygiene and those regular dental visits. Because, too, I've talked to different people who've had transplants and new modulator drugs are helping. But if you get something in your sinuses or you're not having good dental care, it absolutely could affect your new lungs and your health. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so with the transplant, there's so much uh, care that needs to happen afterwards and, and just a lifetime of watching, you know, your health and making sure that you stay healthy. And obviously it's eating good nutrition and it's, you know, staying on top of your meds, but it is also making sure that your mouth is healthy. And I think one of the things that we really tend to forget about is making sure parents have a healthy mouth. So that bacteria that I talked about, that Streptococcus mutans bacteria, that is not a bacteria that is natural to our bodies. It has to be introduced into our bodies. And you can guess who introduces it into most babies and children's mouths. It's us. It's mom. And it's done by putting the pacifier in our mouth and then putting it in the baby's mouth when it falls on the floor. It's done by taking a bite of the baby food to make sure it's not too hot and then putting the spoon in baby's mouth. So we have to be aware that we most likely have that bacteria in our mouths. If we've ever had a cavity, we've got that bacteria in our mouths. We don't want to transfer it into our baby's mouths. So being really cognizant of not transferring our saliva into our baby's mouth. So wash that pacifier under the sink and then pop it in baby's mouth. Take a separate spoon to taste the food and throw that in the sink and then feed baby with a different spoon. And really important because it's going to be hard to remember to do that every time. Just go to the dentist and make sure that your mouth is healthy and that you're not carrying a big bacterial load, especially when you have a child with any type of chronic health condition. Just really making sure that your mouth is healthy and the mouth of people who care for your child. And that's something that we just don't hear a lot about. We don't. And that is great information because I think so Many parents are just, you know, or wiping it with their fingers, maybe with, you know, saliva from, you know, hand to mouth and and that kind of thing if there's not a faucet around. So that is really good information. And what other things should CF patients be aware of prior to a transplant when they're thinking about their dental health? I really think it's just pretty simple. It's just really keeping on top of that oral hygiene. And it is just so easy when you're going into a transplant. And I have no personal experience with this. But when you're going in for anything that major, man, there's a lot going on. You know, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of doctor's visits. There's just a lot happening. And it is really easy to have dental care fall by the wayside. So some of the things that you can do is move up that nighttime brushing. We don't need to brush our teeth right before bed. We only need to brush our teeth after we've had anything to eat or drink other than water. So if your child eats or drinks for the last time at 7 p.m., water is fine. They can have water. But if they eat or drink 
for the last time at 7 p.m., but they don't go to bed till 8.30, go ahead and brush their teeth at 7 p.m. You're less tired. They're less tired. It's less stressful. You don't run the risk that they just fall asleep before you can brush their teeth, you know. So there's ways to kind of help your schedule to do oral health care when you're less stressed and your child is less stressed. And then it's more likely to be successful because we do hear this a lot from parents. If they don't understand the importance of keeping their child's mouth clean and how that's going to impact a surgery or a transplant, we do hear all the time like, no, we didn't brush last night. He was in a really bad mood and I just didn't want to push it. So if they understand that, no, this is really necessary to do, but you can try to move it to a time when you're a little less stressed then immediately before you go to sleep, because it's not just the children who are stressed by that time of the day. I'm stressed by that time of the day. And I will say this. Last night, I was exhausted, went to floss and was like, "Eh, I'm just too tired to do this. And I thought to myself, you should have done it earlier. You haven't eaten for over three hours. You should have just done it right after dinner. But, you know, I did it. And then it didn't get done. So it's easy for that to happen. And that is great advice for parents who have young kids. It will probably help them. Maybe it's partly a routine. This is what we do before we go to bed. But good to know after they've had a meal, they could just encourage their child to do um, the brushing then. I also think it's interesting because I know many of us did think that all the CF medications, the albuterol, the palmazime, the Toby podhalers, all of that, maybe it did impact the teeth. But it's good to hear that because of dental hygiene and just taking care of your teeth, that might not be the case. And so one of the ways that medication can really impact your teeth is the sugars in medication. So especially in liquid medications, uh, they're often putting a lot of sugar in that, especially for children, just so they'll take it. Um, So it's something you can talk to your pharmacist about and say, hey, you know, I'm worried about this medication. And one of the downsides of liquid medication is it really goes, you know, down between the teeth where it's hard to reach. So that's just not an area we want to be putting a lot of liquid sugar in. But you can talk to your pharmacist and say, hey, you know how many medications my child takes. I'm really concerned about the amount of sugar in these medications. Is there a sugar-free alternative that we can use that would still taste okay, but not put that level of sugar in my child's mouth? And that's something typically that they just kind of don't think of until they're asked. And so it's something that parents can ask for any liquid medication. Is there a sugar-free alternative? When we were thinking about this podcast, we talked about a lot of different topics or we were thinking about a lot of different topics. And one of them was shame about not being able to get dental care or maybe not affording it. Even some people in the middle class, I think, decide, well, you know what, that crown or whatever, it's going to cost $1,500 not going to get it done. What alternatives do people have, even if it's not related to cystic fibrosis, if they feel like my insurance doesn't cover that, I'm not going to get this procedure done? What kind of options do people have um, in a variety of economic situations? Yeah, and that is that is a tricky one. We do have a system of nonprofit dental clinics in, in all states are federally qualified health centers um, that are funded by HRSA. They offer sliding fee scales for the procedures that they do. So if you can't afford everything right away, the downside is they're not going to cover things like implants. Uh, they don't do that type of work. For children, um, especially if your child is on Medicaid, which in Michigan is Healthy Kids Dental, that is a robust program that really should and will provide all of the oral health care that your child needs. And if you have any issues, you can call, actually call Healthy Kids Dental and talk to one of the caseworkers. They are really great about working with families and especially children with chronic health needs, making sure that they're getting the dental care that they need. It's a pretty good system for children. It's when we run into the adult system because then we run into you may have commercial insurance, but your employer chose a very stripped down plan, you know, that doesn't cover much and you're having to cover things out of pocket. Then it comes down to working with your dental office um, as far as what you can work out as far as payments. And it is one of the great 
I think, failings of our health system, that people have to make those choices. And they have to make the choice of a root canal is $1,800. I can have the tooth pulled for $100. That's what I'm going to have to do. And it's not in anyone's best interest to ever have a tooth pulled um, if there's an alternative. And I think it's a lot of the work that we do is trying to expand adult Medicaid, which is being expanded in Michigan. Um, It's not fully nailed down what that would look like. But there is an expansion on the table for adult Medicaid, which should get people a lot more services. And then it really is encouraging your employer to choose a good plan that will cover what their employees' needs are and they're not paying a lot out of pocket is really important. And it all comes down to economics at the end of the day. And, you know, from my standpoint, one of the things that's really hard for us, we cannot legally fund individuals' dental care. We can fund through nonprofits who then help individuals with dental care. But if you call me specifically and say, I need $5,000 $5,000 worth of dental work, can you fund that? Legally, I cannot fund that. And we get those calls every day and we really try to refer people and try to get them into a system that can help them, a nonprofit system that can help them. But at the end of the day, it's one of the great failings of our healthcare system that we are not providing adequate oral health care for a good portion of the American population. It really is. And I just see it firsthand, you know, with the Bonnell Foundation, because all these requests we get, I have a folder right here of just this month, you know, of requests. And the dental part of it is the saddest thing because we're helping as much as we can. But sometimes it's in the thousands of dollars for people. And I wonder, Holly, does the advocating with the employer, does that help? Are they listening? Does it take a lot of people that have to advocate or can it be one family who says, listen, we have this situation and could you, you know, improve the policy? Yeah, I think it's often just one family can do that. And if you look at like if the employer, if they are with Delta and they've chosen not to opt in to our our special care benefits, boy, that's an easy fix. You know, that's not going to increase. It's not an extra charge. You're going to be, you know, Um, As far as raising the cap on what the insurance pays and what the insurance covers, you know, employers are looking at the economics of insurance. And while dental insurance is much lower cost than medical, boy, they've really had some significant increases in their medical insurance. So they're looking at overall, what can we afford as a company? Sometimes there just aren't easy answers, and it's not as though the company purposely wants to not give people the best dental insurance they can. They just literally, you know, it's especially with small companies, it's often a matter of economics of what they can afford as far as a benefits package. But we're always advocating for good dental care because at the end of the day, good dental care reduces what you're billing on your medical side. So what good dental care does is it reduces those emergency room visits for an abscess tooth. You know, it reduces all those types of things. So we really want to have good dental care. And it's the least expensive care that we can do as far as insurance. It really is prevention, the prevention that we can get through dental and through those regular dental visits and for tackling things immediately and not letting them get out of hand is a cost savings measure. Um, If you do an emergency room visit for an abscess tooth, that is one expensive visit. I can imagine. Oh, my gosh. Let's talk mouthwash. Is mouthwash a really important part of your day as far as dental care goes? Or if you're flossing, using your toothpaste and doing all of that regularly, do people need a mouthwash as well? That's a great question to talk about with your hygienist, um, because that is sort of a little bit individual. Often uh, the rinse they will recommend is not a straight mouthwash, but it's one of the fluoride washes. Sometimes, depending on your mouth, if you have dry mouth and with CF, dry mouth is often um, something that people have. Then they're going to want to look at not a standard mouthwash, which is all alcohol and is actually a little bit drying. They're going to look at wanting to put you on a different type of mouth rinse. 
So those are excellent questions. The next time you have a hygiene visit to talk to your hygienist about and say, would I benefit from a mouthwash? Would I benefit from a fluoride rinse? Or is there something that you give me that would help me even more? What other information is important, do you think, to people who may be just realizing the importance of taking dental care serious? Start by brushing twice a day and flossing. Use a fluoride toothpaste. Uh, Make sure you're getting all the surfaces of the teeth and make that dentist visit and find out where you can go. If you have private insurance, who's in network and what your insurance will cover. If you're on Medicaid, where can you go to find a provider? If you don't have any insurance at all, looking into the nonprofit system so that you can get that sliding fee scale. And for instance, so we have our community health centers and then we have in Michigan, My Community Dental Centers, which is a statewide network of nonprofit dental clinics. And really getting in and getting that, if if you've not had that dental visit for a while and you've been putting it off, And honestly, the worst reason people put it off is because they think there's a problem. And they're like, I think there is a problem. I have this tooth that hurts all the time. I don't want to go to the dentist and find out for sure. That's the wrong answer. Go to the dentist. Go to the dentist. Find out for sure. Get it taken care of before it blows up into something horrifically painful. And you're dealing with, you know, a lot more than you need to be dealing with. So just get into that dentist and talk to your hygienist. Hygienists are such great educators. When they clean your teeth, they are always educating you about places you're missing on brushing and different things that you could and should be doing and products you could be using that would make things better and really listen to them when they talk to you and and just be open to what they say and to following the instructions that the dental team gives you because they are the experts and more than anybody, they want to see you have a healthy mouth. What about People who are looking to pay less, maybe their coverage isn't great. What about uh, dental schools like at universities? Is that an option? Yes, absolutely. So in Michigan, we have two dental schools. We have Detroit Mercy in Detroit and we have University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. They both have community dental clinics. They are excellent resources for dental care. And they are certainly, if you live in those areas or can travel to those areas, they are an excellent place to make an appointment uh, and and make sure you can get the dental care that you need. And what about braces? Is this just something Americans like to do? Is there usually a reason people need braces? I mean, they don't get braces in the UK. They do now. Do they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So my husband's British. All three of his nephews have had braces. Years ago, they didn't. But yes. So braces, orthodontia is very interesting. There are probably relatively few cases where orthodontia is 100% cosmetic, where it's just like, yeah, my teeth are a little bit out of line and I would like them to be straighter. So I've done it twice. I had braces when I was young and then a few of my teeth shifted as I aged, which, by the way, is incredibly common. As we age and we lose bone, uh, our teeth start to shift. Um, So my teeth had shifted. I did Invisalign. That was cosmetic. That was 100% cosmetic. I just wanted to straighten out my teeth. But the first time I had orthodontia, that was not cosmetic. So when you talk to an orthodontist and they evaluate your mouth, one of the things they're looking for is how your teeth hit each other and how your jaw is aligned. And if your teeth are not aligned, and they're hitting each other in the way they're not intended to hit each other when you bite. As you age, that will put a lot of pressure on your teeth, which will result in your teeth breaking, possibly. It will result in jaw pain. So we really want to, if our child's teeth are are not fully in alignment, really have them evaluated early, age eight, age nine, because often when we start orthodontia very early, it's not as long of a process and they can really get in there before they're done growing and align things. Um, So as they grow, everything's aligned. But the real purpose of orthodontia is to save our adult teeth and to save us from pain with our jaw being out of alignment. So typically it is done for more of a medical reason than a cosmetic reason. That is very interesting. You have so much information about dental care, obviously, because this is your life. But is there something we didn't talk about that's really important 
uh, tips or anything else that you might be able to enlighten us about? You know, I would say there's a couple of really cool products out there. And um, I normally don't like to endorse actual products. But the one I'm going to tell you about is a unique product. No one else is making it and it's not expensive. And that is the Colgate Hum Toothbrush. So when we brush with electric toothbrushes, they do a better job than just our regular toothbrush. They really do brush our teeth better. But the Colgate Hum is super cool. It's new and they have a couple different models for the little kids. You can hook it to um, have your cell phone in there. And as they're brushing, it's like putting their face up there with different cartoon characters and different games. So what it's doing is it's engaging kids in brushing and it's keeping them brushing longer, which is what we want. As they get older, my youngest children are teenagers. They use the adult hum. What that does is it also hooks to your cell phone and it gives you a readout after you brush of what areas you missed. So depending on when, whether you're left or right-handed, there are certain quadrants that you tend a little bit to miss because it's just a little harder to get the toothbrush in there. So it points that out to you. And it says you didn't brush long enough here. You missed this. But it also does it in a positive reinforcing way. And, and you can earn badges. And, you know, you get congratulated when you hit all the areas of your mouth. I have seen with my children... And I actually, uh, Colgate is one of the companies that I routinely interact with, with their research and their philanthropy department. And that was how I got the hum was I was talking to the person uh, who works there and saying that my children had both just had a bad dental visit. They both had cavities and the dentist said they are not brushing well. And she said, I can solve this problem for you. She sent me the hum. And they got so into this, you know, this mapping. They have had really good dental visits ever since then. Um, so there are products out there that can really encourage your children to brush. Um, we have an app. It's a free app for children. It's called All Smile Shine. If you go on either Android or the iPhone um, store, you can download it for free. And it's really all kinds of ways to encourage brushing at home fun things to do, how to make the dental visit easier. So, you know, there's always an app for that. Right. You know, whatever you need to do. But there are also some great products out there that aren't high cost that can really encourage your children to brush. And you can do something as simple as, you know, a short video and just put the phone in the bathroom and say two minutes, you get to watch this thing you really like. And, you know, two minutes in, then we're done and distract them you know, while while you're brushing their teeth or they're brushing. And one of the important things to remember is we should be brushing children's teeth until they're about six years old. They don't have the manual dexterity to clean their own teeth. So I always cringe when I hear a mom say, you know, when you talk about her two or three year old and she'll say, yeah, he brushes his own teeth. It's like, no, he doesn't. <laughs> you know, like he's doing <laughs> something in there, but it's not brushing his teeth. So it's fine to let them have the first go because they want to do it themselves. And then you say, yeah. that was great. Now let me finish up for you and you brush their teeth properly. So there's lots of ways to distract children, to encourage children. But some of the new products that are out there that are like, you know, linked to the cell phone, they're a lot of fun and they make brushing really fun. That does sound fun. And you have so much information. I mean, Holly makes dentistry fun. <laughs> really, it's um, you've given us great information, great insight. Thank you. That product we're all put in the show notes. So if people are interested in that toothbrush, they can look at that as well. But so much information. Thank you. Um, it's really important to everyone and definitely the CF community to raise awareness about dental care and just keeping your teeth healthy because it keeps your entire body healthy. Absolutely. So, Holly, thank you for sharing all your knowledge with us. It's very interesting. Thank you for having me. It's been delightful. It has. Thank you. The original music in this podcast is performed by Kevin Allen. It's not complicated. Who happens to have cystic fibrosis. We all got our worries and fears. I know what's got you frustrated. But loving you is so all right. This has been the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast. For more information and to learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, 
Visit our website at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's the B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was sponsored by Beatrice, Genentech, and Vertex. It was produced by Jagging Detroit Podcasts. Follow our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now.